one hour and we need a note taker. Well, this button would work if it was enabled, but it's not. No, it really. It was my first attempt as well. It doesn't matter. You Greetings all TSBWGers and we are still looking for a note taker to volunteer. Oh, Spencer stuck his hand in the air. Um, <laughs> uh, but maybe that wasn't intentional. Uh, <laughs> no? Are we out? Okay. Well, um, we, could, we could do a consensus call where we think Spencer had his hand in the air. Um, <laughs> So um, I actually was uh, talking to a first-time attendee in the hallway, and the next thing I was going to tell uh, this first-time attendee was it is a good thing to volunteer to take minutes, mm -hmm. because if you do that, you can say, I'm new, and I need people in the, in the uh, hedge doc document you know, helping because I don't, you know, I won't know, I may not know names and not everybody says stuff, especially in the room, you know, so stuff like that. So uh, I would invite any first time attendees to either help or volunteer to, to be the primary note taker. If, if someone else does that, I will help. Ooh, okay, so if somebody and, and, wishes and no to pressure, experiment no with pressure helping. for the person I was talking to, because because I know that there are multiple for some attendees yeah. in San Francisco. Sure, this is a good call. We do it via the collaborative note taking app. So, okay, okay, we got one. Okay, excellent. And Feel yourself what, privileged because once you, once we are you very hit grateful. Two, then all you have then then additional people all you have to do is look at what's happening and make sure that it's somewhat coherent and reflects somewhat what happened in the room. All we're really doing is major decision points, right? Major decision points, right? This is for the chairs. Uh, major decision points, right? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, sorry. We are trying that, to run that, that's, what you, that's what a packet timeout looks like. And that means that we don't have to read you poetry or anything. We can actually do the meeting. So let's start TSVWG. If you're uh, here, uh, this is the transport area uh, working group. And um, if you don't think there's anything interesting going on in transport, then you're wrong. <laughs> Please stay anyway. Um, I'm Gori, and this is Martin. Next slide. This is the note well. It's written in small print, but it's quite serious. We <laughs> expect people to have read this. Please do. Um, it defines how we operate in the IETF. It defines our policy for treating IPR. And we do take IPR seriously, both from trying to produce open standards, but also from sometimes having to incorporate material which is covered by IPR statements. So read this. 
Anything you say at the mic or contribute on the mailing list is regarded under this not well as a contribution. We have a note taker. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we need review. Well, okay, you were the backup note taker. <laughs> the honored person is the note taker, and you're the backup, Spencer. It, yeah, it is a backup. Uh, <laughs> we also need re reviewers for working group drafts. So if you see um, documents appearing today, which are um, a document you're interested in, please send comments. They're always welcome. Um, if you see documents reaching a mature level, please read them again. Please send comments. Uh, we rely on your reviews to make progress. If you're proposing a new internet draft, please include the string minus TSBWG minus in place of the uh, working group, and we will put that after your name, in other words, and then we will track it and notice that it exists. This is an area working group. You do need to submit your drafts before the draft deadline. Uh, really, you need to submit new work in plenty of time to receive review before the meeting happens. So talk to us if you have any questions, we'd be happy to help. Next. Um, we're using MeTechO to manage the mic cube. If you don't understand that, um, have a look and wave at us. We will use MeTechO. Next slide. Okay, shall I just go quickly through this? Yep, okay, I'm going quickly through this. Um, we have published one RFC in the last period. Small feeling of celebration. Um, the DSCP considerations draft is now RFC 9435. We currently have no RFC editor drafts, but we will work hard to get some uh, drafts past working group last call into the RFC editor process by the IESG. Next slide. Uh, these are the drafts we're trying to push at the moment. We're trying to make the ECN encapsulation for lower layer protocols, the ECN for tunnels, complete are ready to forward with a publication request to the IESG. These concluded working group last call some time ago. There was a small number of paragraphs which were asked for further scrutiny. That scrutiny has now been done. We have proposed new text, which we intend to incorporate into the uh, document. And when it's complete, we will provide a write-up uh, pointing at the new version of the draft for the working group to see and it will then pass up to our wonderful area director for scrutiny. Three drafts have completed a working group last call and are with the working group again. That's UDP options, DPLP, MTUD for UDP options, which relies on that, and non q building PHB, all of which we plan to progress as soon as we get consensus on the documents. We have some remaining working group ideas. This is a list of documents which are currently being adopted. Um, check the tracker if you want to look at it. Next slide. We have some working group milestones. These were updated. Um, we've been trying to keep the milestones correct according to our understanding. So if you have any questions regarding milestones, please let us know. Um, one curious thing in our milestone list is the DTLS over SCTP work, which the milestone said should have been completed. Uh, that will be discussed when we talk about DTLS over SCTP and a new milestone will be issued when we know what to do with that um, milestone. We will continue the work item. We might just change the milestone. Next, yes, related individual drafts. There's a lot of drafts around this working group, um, some of which will be presented at this meeting, some of which will not be presented this meeting, um, a few of which marked with a star depend on the UDP options draft. Uh, so that is now one of the ones we would like to try and complete because we have dependent drafts that also might wish to use that. And one of them with two stars, or two of them with two stars, are actually being transferred to CCWG, where their fate will be determined by that working group. So they'll no longer be our drafts. So, uh, we have an agenda. This is the agenda for session one. If you'd like to comment on it, please come to the mic or raise your hand in MeTechO. It's been published for a while. We do try and get early agendas out. Next slide. 
This is the agenda for session two. You'll see we have two hours in session two. And next. And we have a lot of things to do also in session two, part two. Anybody got any comments on our agenda or anything that they feel should have been brought to the group, which isn't on our agenda? Going once, going twice, that's our agenda. There we have Martin. Okay. So, um, a proposal for uh, the procedure, how we work in this working group. Um, the chairs are convinced that um, we, should, uh, we should embrace GitHub, as a lot of other working groups do uh, at the ITF and have made um, pretty good, good experience with. Um, if you're interested in the, in, in the details, how, how this works, we have an RFC for that. Um, that's RFC 8874. Uh, we've already registered a uh, GitHub org. Uh, it's the TSVWG, um, where we can now create repositories for um, for drafts that are adopted by uh, by the by the working group. So this is mainly an offer for editors of documents that are already adopted uh, by this working group. Um, and we would like uh, to invite them to um, move move their draft um, to um, to our uh, our new GitHub org. If you're already using GitHub, that's pretty easy. Um, please contact us, and we we can help you uh, figure out the details there. Um, this would allow us to uh, to use uh, well. First of all, use the issue tracker. Um, for any issues that come up um, with the draft. It would allow other people to open new issues uh, on the draft on that GitHub repo. Um, we can also use the, the pull request uh, process to um, propose and discuss changes and then merge them into the next uh, revision of the draft. Um, for, for drafts that are not managed uh, in, in Git, um, we can also just create the, the GitHub repo, and we actually did this for, for one of the drafts already, uh, just to use the issue tracker. Um, it turns out it is very helpful to just have a, have a tool um, to, to be able to track all the issues and, and the status made, made on, on resolving those. Um, there's tooling around, and we will install this bot in the um, in the GitHub org that compiles a summary of um, all activity that happens in the last week, and then sends out an email. I think every every Sunday, um, we intend to install that in, in TSVWG as well. So you don't need to subscribe to uh, to to every every uh, repo if you just want to stay up to date um, with what's going on. And we would like to ask for some, some, some feedback on this. Is, are there any objections on, on using GitHub in, in this working group? Magnus Wettlund Eriksson. Definitely not an objection. I think it's a, a great idea, so, uh, but um, yeah. Not an um, objection, it's Bob Briscoe. Just an observation that um, if GitHub software was ever compromised, the whole world would stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Spencer Dawkins, I'm just, uh, and I'm just observing that I think a lot of the objections that I've heard in other working groups um, were about uh, perception of a forced march to use GitHub for managing the drafts, and you're you're not talking about that. So I would expect uh, very few objections to the style of use that you're talking about. Thank you. So the way I see this working is we use the mailing list to discuss things as normal. If you want to, um, after you've found something on the mailing list, you want to record it in GitHub because you feel it is an issue that can be addressed, then please make an entry there. Um, if you're unsure, contact the chairs. We, we, we can make that for you. Um, 
use GitHub to resolve the issue if you wish, but use the mailing list to discuss things. This is still okay. We, we, we will use both. Um, and to give an example of how that works really well, when we've done a working group last call, and then we see discussion on the list, we will make sure those items are represented in GitHub. And then we know that we've actually looked at them. We know who has commented, which way it's gone. And then when we get to a final working group last call, we can make sure that we know, we know why the document is ready for that working group last call. And anyone else can see this process. It will be totally evident to anyone who wishes to look at it. That's just you on the list. So that's us done. The first talk then, yeah? And the first talk's John. Um, this is a talk that was um, given time previously in an IETF, and John's time was consumed. So we put him at the very front, even though it's an individual presentation. We now hand over to John to talk about media header extensions for wireless networks. So thank you. This is the media header wireless draft. Let me get second page, please. Oh. Okay, great. Next. Um, so here's the outline of the draft on the left side of the page. Um, we have an introduction in the architecture before getting into the media metadata itself, and uh, then the metadata transport and some background around that. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through the motivation for this and the problem statement and everything like that before getting into the details of um, how we are planning to implement uh, this and also mainly the comments that we have received around this in the last few days, especially. Should I drive the slides? Yeah. yeah I <laughs> Thank you. So this slide is an introduction which gives the motivation for this problem. Um, on the left side of the figure, you'll see the wireless router and the client, and the network in between is a wireless network that experiences large variations in capacity over very short periods of time. And this cannot be solved by end-to-end um, you know, -end congestion control, per se, because that, that operates on the order uh, or a couple of magnitude of the, time order. For example, for the end-to-end -to, -end to react, it would take probably in the order of 50 to 100 milliseconds, while the changes in the wireless network are occurring in the order of milliseconds, and the schedulers are acting on that. And this is transient, so it's not a permanent condition. So we don't want to really drop the rates. Um, as a result of this observation and the need for media, uh, um, some of the media uh, applications that are being addressed here uh, that require both uh, high throughput and low latency. Um, what 3GPP has done is to use a combination of L4S and ECN for the long-term handling along with RTT and others, and also selective uh, groups of packets to be dropped. Uh, this is now a, a 3GPP standard in, that operates with unencrypted data. Uh, this draft is trying to address how we can class or give information that can categorize and prioritize these, um, how to drop these sets of data or uh, prioritize or delay or, or, or give headroom to that in the wireless network. So that's, the, that's an outline of why we're doing this kind of a draft. Um, the criteria for um, carrying this in in, the, in some kind of protocol between the uh, media server and this wireless router that classifies is first it should be able to do a priority for a group of packets, not the whole flow. Uh, separate sets may have different priorities. Uh, th there may be a delay budget associated with it. Um, some may be more important, but can tolerate more delay, for example. Um, and uh, there is a burst size. For example, if it's a video iframe, that may consist of 400 packets. And it's useful for the wireless network to know that it should reserve enough headroom 
for uh, the scheduler to accommodate that amount of uh, bur that burst. Uh, so this information would help to optimize um, how the wireless network operates. And as I said before, it's been done for RTP by using RTP headers and the extension headers and using that to classify. But the real problem is that most of the media is encrypted. And this is work that's coming up in the next release. So for 3GPP, it would be most useful, I think, if it's developed in one to two years. However, I want to point out that this draft is not just about 3GPP. It's a problem that I've talked to my co-authors with that affects um, all wireless networks, for sure, uh, Wi-Fi, and to our understanding, even cable networks to a great extent. So that's the problem statement. Let me go to the next page and try to go through the architecture and then how we're trying to address it. So mainly, as was, um, if we go from the, the right hand side of the figure, the, the server or the, what's marked as a server or the application inserts, I mean, sends the UDP payload, which is encrypted, which contains the media information and adds uh, an option, a UDP option called MED. And this option gives that data that was mentioned in the earlier slide about uh, priority, delay, and um, burst size, along with some other information. And what the wireless uh, router does is to inspect this data, and it's then used to shape and schedule the wireless network, but it does not remove the data. It is sent all the way to the client, which may collect this information and use that to send more accurate feedback information to the application. Um, and and then the client to server network acts as a longer um, time frame. Um, the last thing is to say that the payload is always encrypted end to end, and the metadata is also carried end to end, but only inspected by the wireless network to use for classification. On the next page. So this is what the metadata transport option looks like. Uh, there are a lot of parameters there, but mainly if we look at it, there's importance, which is the relative priority of the packets. Uh, there's a timestamp field for which we've received comments that uh, you know, it should be adjusted to be more, have more resolution and we'll take that as an action point. Um, there's other aspect, which is an MDU sequence number, which identifies the group of packets that belongs to that, um, uh, to that group of packets. Um, a packet counter and all to keep track of loss and other things. But the key parameters are the other ones, the data burst and delay along with importance. These are the three um, so far as we know that will be used or will help to use to um, improve the latency and performance on the wireless network. Um, just to note that again, the MED is not altered and so it's a safe UDP option. There have been some comments or several comments on this, so I'll address that in slide six, but I'll just go ahead and complete the discussion in the next page before getting to the comments that we received. Oh, we're already there. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I think this is where we probably need to spend more time because uh, these are the comments that we received because this is an area which where we could use several mechanisms perhaps. And uh, the choice of why we chose uh, UDP option and, and uh, how we apply to the criteria that I mentioned on page one itself, which is um, it, it's not just about uh, setting a priority level like a DSCP, but just for a few packets, but there are burst sizes and delay budgets that change over applications and time and the way it's encoded and all of that. So these are dynamic properties. Uh, so it wouldn't be possible to simply substitute and just have a, a parameter that we could send and that parameter to identify it. So this information changes. And so whatever we choose should be able to accommodate that. So with that in mind, oh, oh, and, a, and a, a couple of other things, we want a mechanism that obviously can be you know, standardized or um, you know, adopted by the group in a in a shorter period of time because there's a target related to this, hopefully. And um, uh, the other thing is that, in terms of the architecture, the 
the nodes that insert this data may be a, a server at the data center, but it also may be a wireless node or you know, uh, some other entity that's uh, on the wireless network that's inserting that data. So it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, not just a server to client kind of um, traffic. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll go through the comments that we've gotten. I mean, the questions were about why, why UDP options and uh, against a whole bunch of other options. So looking at each of those, there's DSCP. Um, and I think based on the discussion on the list, it's the, the understanding is that DSCP has limited code points and we need multiple priority levels here. And even more significantly, I think DSCP just will not be able to convey it. It's probably impossible to com convey things like burst size and delay budgets. So uh, that's not a good option per se. The other one that came up was IPv6 flow label. And um, my understanding was that you couldn't change it over the length of a session, but I think it was clarified by Sebastian that uh, we could change these for, uh, for a group of packets. Um, and uh, so I think that's a very useful um, update. Maybe we can use that. Um, however, we should note that for IPv4, there is no flow label. And uh, while we would like to work with just IPv6, I think for the 3GPP case, we cannot ignore IPv4 at the moment. Um, IPv6 hop by hop header extensions are a pretty strong case there. I mean, um, it's, it's feasible in a managed network like 3GPP, which is what this uh, solution is targeting. However, we'd have to look at extending IPv4 options and that seems to be pretty challenging, I think. Um, and the other factor that may play into this is that the wireless network entity like a UPF it's not a router per se, but an application that is hosted on a router, or it may be a server in the, in the data center uh, in the more recent deployments. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could do IPv6 options, but um, it seems to me, at least the UDP options seem interesting enough. Um, and let me just go over the last one and take one question. Um, the, the UDP options themselves, though, um, do manage to cover all the cases that are interesting in terms of low latency media, um, RTP and quick. And uh, so it may be the, the lowest layer that can, uh, I mean, or the highest layer that can address all of these. But the questions that have come up on the list are, how do you manage performance of lookups when UDP options are in the trailer? And uh, is there, I mean, Separately, is there an opportunity to optimize this, the use of IPv6 flow labels? And I think the options in the trailer may delay, I mean, may increase the latency of processing, but we could, if the assumption that the flow label can be changed uh, during the course of a flow, then not every packet needs a lookup uh, at, the, um, at the wireless router. Um, only one group of packets needs to, and we could send a code or some other creative mechanism which we can think of in this group. So, you know, we could uh, address that uh, performance aspect by not having to look at uh, everything. For example, if it's an iframe with those 400 packets, uh, we probably only send that code once or twice in the very beginning, and then that code could be sent over um, um, the flow label. I'll stop there, and this, this was a discussion so far, so I'll take it. So, Gori Fairhurst is an individual in, and frequent six-man participant rather than TSV. Um, you don't include destination option, which I would have thought was the most likely extension header to use, rather than hop by hop. Hop by hop typically uh, being used for things that are modifiable along the path rather than things that are end-to-end. -end. Do you, have you thought about using destination options? No, we, we briefly looked at only the IPv6 hop by hop options. And that was because we wanted the option to be available at the endpoint so that the endpoint can communicate uh, finer measurements and so on to the application um, so that 
you know, the application would uh, be aware fully of what the network has done with these packets. So for example, oh. measurement details and other things to the application. So the network wouldn't be able to, for example, reduce the rate without the knowledge of the application, uh, for example. Okay, clearly you, can, you clearly can look at that later. Um, the, the flow label, as I understand it, is immutable for a flow, as in it defines what a flow is. So if you use two flow labels, you create two flows. That's the definition of what a flow label is. And these flows are independently routed. They're independently used by the IPv6 system. Right. I think from the wireless side, I think um, it should be no problem at all because what we would eventually do is classify into multiple flows that the radio handles in parallel based on these priorities. So it's actually ideal in that sense. But from the IP network itself, my understanding was that this was just not possible or there are side effects in terms of how it's routed or the firewall handles it or something else. You know. HIP flow, V6 flow level determines a flow. Okay, that's my question. Statement. More Hi, uh, Tom Herbert. So, Gory, um, one other point I'd, I'd make. So, if this is if it's required that intermediate nodes inspect any part of the data, by definition, that can't be a destination option, right? Because destination options are end to end; they're not supposed to be processed by intermediate nodes. But that being said, that's the, the same thing is true for UDP options anyway. So. If you go in, into that realm, you're in, in the realm of basically doing something that is architecturally not correct, whether or not it makes sense based on the pragmatics of not being able to use hop by hop options, I think that's a good, good discussion for the list. Mm -hmm. But I did want to make one point um, about the use of flow label. I would be very, really careful to make it only have one mechanism. So for instance, if you say, well, we use the UDP options for some traffic, but as an optimization, uh, hopefully most of the traffic will use a flow label. Problem with that is if you get into a scenario where the flow label is not available and, and it kind of starts to act like a cache, if your cache miss ratio becomes too high, you may always go to UDP options, and if that's your slow path, that's what can drag down the network. So my recommendation is one or the other. Um, mixing and matching gets really risky because now you have, you're, you're making assumptions on the workload that may or may not pan out, and you also open up the potential for denial of service attack. Oh. Point taken. I don't know if this, um, I missed this on my reading list. I wish I had read it. Uh, there seems to be a huge opportunity here and a lot of alligators. Good luck. Magnus Vestlund, uh, Ericsson. <clears throat> I think there's a poten other potential here. It's actually because, especially in this 3 dpp case, you're actually addressing one single node on the path in the user data plane. And you could actually address that specifically as long as you can link a set of packets to this metadata that you want to provide and have an explicit communication between the one creating this information and the consumer. Um, that is one option that has already been standardized to an extent by 3GPP. What I think you're referring to is to, to use a control plane to signal that the packets Not you expect on the user plane has these properties. Mm -hmm. But the set of uh, um, and the variables that are included and the change that uh, can take place uh, I think the general preference would be even in 3GPP to use a user plane indication augmented by some information in the control plane. Yeah, but my, not entirely. <laughs> so I wasn't referring to the control plane based. It's actually to do something that you address the user plane node in the user plane uh, with, with a suitable linkage. Uh, right. So. I think, uh, yeah, those so. options are. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and the reason I bring this up is that the side meeting after this is, is maybe talking about this particular. The SAD CDN, et cetera, is, is, in the, is in the vein of this. So it might be a potential venue for going forward with suitable solution for this one also. Thank you. So I, I suggest you flip to the final slide. And let's see. 
I guess we could ask some questions rather than you present this, if that's okay. Yes, I think that's... I mean, I would be interested to know um, how many people have read this draft. Um, it's been on our agenda for a couple of meetings. Um, can we use the show of hands tool? Do we know how to do that? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, well, we'll wait a minute. We're, we're, we will do. We shall, we shall say a number. Uh, what we're asking for the first question here is how many people have read this version of the draft or a recent version? There has been um, a couple of versions of this. Please raise your hand if you have read this draft. Well, it's clear that um, a number of people have read it. We've seen 14. There may be more in the room. There may be more um, out there. That, that's a reasonable number, so that's good. Uh, you should feel encouraged by that. Um, how many people are interested in work in this space, as in trying to solve this problem, not necessarily using this draft, not necessarily using any technique we've talked about, but are interested in this um, topic as an area uh, where we might do future work. So we're away from doing any adoption of any sort. What we're asking for is to try and solve the problems which were stated in the draft. Is this an area where you have interest and you think you might devote some time in this working group? Uh, clarifying question. What is the area? Because if I look at this at the highest level, what I see is we want devices that can signal the network with some sort of information, whether it be QoS policy or something like that. So can Explicit, you clarify a little bit about what the area actually yeah, is? Explicitly signal information to help radio networks to process the packets um, along the lines of what John has indicated. And the draft actually goes into the three GPB specs that do this with IPv4. Uh, Bob Briscoe, does that include trying to solve the problem in other ways? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is, I mean, is this an interesting I mean, in problem? in other ways than talking to the network. Is this an interesting problem to work upon, is the question. Right, and we're already gathering some people. Um, please Sorry, comment. Just the one uh, clarification, you said yes. it to signal. So signal, who's going to signaling to the you know, receiver side and on which layer? Can you specify that one before we go? I don't mind. Um, I'm, all, I'm not asking for adoption of anything. I'm just asking whether this is a topic that might be of interest to put on the agenda next time. So any layer is the answer to that. It helps us budget for agenda time. And in a moment, we'll close the list. Um, John, do you have any final comments? Um, I think we will have some information here. Um, I would say that, you know, we're, we're not picky about one solution per se, but we're interested, obviously, in having a solution that's timely and that the 3GPP can use. So, and I believe that the IETF is the right place to do this. work. Okay, so in summary here, uh, people who have read the draft, um, 14 were noted, interested in doing this kind of work, not necessarily using this draft or any of these mechanisms, 27 people noted an interest. This sounds like a topic that will return at the next IETF meeting. Please use the list to discuss this topic. Thank you. Um, note to people that um, you need to use the um, app or your laptop to join this meeting, not just for me, Tekel, but for us to count the number of people in the room. If people don't do this, we will get a shoebox to meet in next, next time because we will think the meeting contains only five or six people. So please join um, me, Tekel, uh, if you're in this room. It will help us with planning the size of our meeting in future. Next talk. Could, could, could I do a scribe interrupt and just ask uh, people who said something during the discussion check what uh, the scribes um, oh, yes. you know, actually captured and make sure that that's correct. Um, thank you. Yep, the notes are modifiable if you think you can do better than the note takers. Or, uh, or you spot anything else, please, please tell us uh, after the meeting. Next slide deck. It's, it's me, is it? Oh, it's me. Okay, right, I can do this. 
or do we have yeah and then my turn yeah okay i will talk about datagram path and PR, packetization layer path MTU discovery for UDP options, the longest acronym we have so far, and we're at version 10. Next slide. Um, this is a joint work by Tom and I. Um, Tom's just got married um, um, a couple of weeks ago, so he hasn't actually prepared these slides, but um, that's just a call out to Tom. Um, we're currently at Working Group Draft 10. We've done a number of revisions since we last reported on this, primarily people contributing comments from the Working Group. Thanks ever so much to all those people who did that work of carefully reading through this draft. Next slide. Um, there's no pending issues. We're now waiting for completion of UDP options. If you're smart enough or you're just interested enough, Please read the draft and send us more comments and we'll happily update. Otherwise, we will part this waiting for UDP options to be published. Wow. Okay. I can now come back to the mic as a chair and tell you the list of IDs that reference UDP options. Uh, we now have a growing number of internet drafts that reference UDP options. Um, most of these are proposals um, for doing extra uses of UDP options. Um, they might be of interest also to this working group. Uh, some of these will be presented um, later in the meeting. Um, not all of them have presentations, but they all refer to UDP options, which is why we think UDP options is something that we'd now like to try and complete as a working group. I'm going to sit down. Is that Mike? So is Mike heard online? If Mike's online, maybe you could come. Right. We have Martin instead. Come to me. Yeah, Martin Duke, uh, Google, and speaking as AD, like um, just to, to talk about this, like applications of, of UDP options, oh. um, Christian and I have been kind of going on this in Zulip, but um, <clears throat> there's a class of UDP option application that is, let me take the stuff that's in the encryption and put it in the UDP header so we can read it again. Um, and like, I, I understand that it has performance benefits. However, that has, has a, there's a poor recent track record in the ITF. And um, uh, just because this room thinks it's a great idea does not mean it's going to survive last call. So I, I think we need to think hard about that problem and um, maybe bring in some outside skeptics before we adopt that particular flavor of UDP option. Um, that's just a general comment about these, these proposals. Thank you. So Mike has been, um, was, was Mike requested? Can we give it, grant him? Um, Mike Hurd has been um, looking through the UDP options comments and helping to contribute review. And I was hoping we'd be able to lead discussion here. Mike, do you have a mic? Yes. Oh, good. Yes, I do have a mic then. Ah, excellent. Mike has a mic. <laughs> That's good. Right, so um, let's press the next. Let's, so we, maybe you could help us guide through um, what Joe's been saying, if that's all right, I, I will happily fill in anything I can to contribute further. And we, first of all, thought we'd be useful to look at Joe's proposed five basic tenets for developing UDP options. Right. This um, After Joe uh, came back from vacation to be greeted by many, many messages, he proposed uh, five basic tenets. Um, I'm in a, uh, speaking for myself. I'm pretty much in agreements with all except perhaps E, uh, where incomplete frameworks I think have uh, are threatening to get us into some some issues. And 
Um, Magnus is, uh, Westerland has uh, raised, raised that issue as well. And I thought it might be worthwhile to ask the, uh, the working group to uh, reply to that message of Joe's and see if, uh, you know, take a step back. Are we, are we on the, uh, the right track with what we're doing? And that's why I put this together. Uh, I, th I think that helps, Mike. I, I think this is a good yeah, question. Yeah, and uh, Cr Christian wants to uh, step in, please. Please do, Christian. I, I would propose a uh, number six tenet that says that UDP option should never be attached to UDP encrypted packets. And should not be attached. Should, should never not be, be attached, attached to what? To UDP, Christian? To encrypted to encrypted UDP packets. But I thought there was already an, there's already text really, which warns against it, but not it's not actually a tenant. That yet. text was that text was actually removed from the security considerations. It is not in the latest draft. I mean, it was proposed, but it was not actually added. I think that's correct. Proposed but that, not actively added. Uh, yeah. Speaking personally, I think that's that that the proposal is correct, but I'm an individual. Uh, because I mean, all, all the abuse that we saw in the previous presentation are about taking encrypted information and putting that in clear text so the network can read it. And and we don't want that. I mean, that's not what. Uh, that's bad architecture, that's not what we want. And so it should be very clear that, no, don't do that for encrypted transports. Mira? I mean, I do agree kind of, but it doesn't that kind of uh, contradict the first thing here. It kind of makes UDP stateful and especially it makes, puts a dependency in UDP on higher layer knowledge, which you might not have. No, it, it does not, Mirya. Basically, if you put that in your text, that means that any uh, protocol that knows, any end station, any router that knows that you are carrying, say, Quick, for example, will drop any packet that carries a UDP option because it's only an attack. In other that's, words, you'd have to use a tunnel header or something else rather than a UDP option to do that. That's even worse. So I just add, like, I just use some spare space in your packet, add a UDP option and make sure somebody drops it. Or at, at the minimum, you drop the damn option. I'm not sure how that helps, but maybe I don't well, understand it. it. No, basically, it, it, create, it creates a blocking point to deployment because if you block deployment, then you block the abuse at the same time. If you don't block deployment, then the abuse gets ingrained in the network and become hard to remove after that. So you want a middle box to somehow figure out that whatever is above the UDP header is encrypted or quick or whatever, which is a feature that we didn't build into quick. And then you want a middle box to interfere with the packet. If it is not the middle box that does it, then the endpoint shall do it. But the endpoint well, can always just ignore the UDP option anyway. No, it shall actively destroy the packet. Again, that's because it's an attack. Because, 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 because the other endpoint shall never do that. So the data is obviously an attack. So it should be destroyed. But that open attack that I can easily destroy a packet. I don't know. If you can modify it, but if, if an endpoint if, can if modify you're an attacker a packet, that can, can modify the packet, then you don't need a UDP option to make that packet um, useless to the endpoint. Uh, Martin Duke, I, I don't know if we're still on the tenants or we're talking about something else, but um, I mean, so I, I, there's like two separate issues here. Um, one is like, should we have a later eight restriction in UDP options that say like UDP options shall not do this? And then, you know, we're not the protocol police, but like they should not do this. And then, then should, should we have some sort of actual enforcement mechanism 
uh, that punishes endpoints that break the law, break the must. And um, I, I am a, I'm a little skeptical of that for a lot of reasons that Miri has said, but I support the first contention, which is that we should say must not as, as an individual. Igor Lobachev, uh, on the same point of, uh, I think, anything that we do that uh, obviously breaks some feature of a protocol, right, it wouldn't be accepted by ETF, but I think Christian thinks, uh, think, I think you, you are a little bit too, uh, network can do worse. So, for example, network can remove, uh, once cons uh, the signal is consumed, uh, remove the UDP option. So it's transmitted. Um, so it's not as easy as to say that, oh, okay, just don't do it because ne you will never deploy it. It's deployable uh, with a cooperating network. Now it's a question whether you want to do it, uh, but that's like a different debate. Christine, have you finished? Shall we are you take you out of line? No question, just don't. Okay, Christian, the, the, go ahead then. Yes, networks can attach data to packet. They can do that, of course. They can do encapsulation. They can do whatever they want. But if they do remove it, then we have we are in a better place than if they don't, because that means that it stays inside single single networks, control domains, whatever it is you call it. That's much better than trying to build this end-to-end -end communication channel. It also remove all. I mean, let's face it. If you add any kind of clear text protocol to UDP, you are adding the attack surface. It's, it's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, it becomes a new shiny object in which it can be attacked. It can be attacked by inserting information. It can be attacked by attacking false information. It can be attacked by exploiting bugs in implementation. So it's an additional weakness that you attach to an existing protocol. And, and I think, I mean, we should not deploy that in general. We should certainly not deploy that in a secure protocol. Corey, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, the attack surface already exists. The surplus area can already be transmitted. There is no new threat. No, it is a new threat. No, the, it is that, not. Well, it already it, exists. It already has existed ever since UDP existed. That is Sorry, true. but that's the facts. It is true that, it, that endpoints can add, I mean, intermediate can add data at the tail of the IP packet. That is true. What is not true is that the endpoints are supposed to process it, which they are not supposed to do now. So if you add the idea that the endpoint are supposed to process it, you do indeed increase the attack surface. We need to decide if we wanted to discuss any other comments or whether we just want to hold on the rest and cover them next meeting. So comment. You want to comment? Uh, Tom Robert. So I think to Christian's point, if we extrapolate this, if we deploy UDP options and there's ever a denial of service attack because of them, the, net, the, the response from a network provider may very well be just drop all packets with surplus options. And I think that is a very real risk. It's, that's the simplest thing they can do at the edge. Um, it's just a matter of comparing two numbers. So I would be really careful um, with this because the, the risk is very high for a new protocol that has yet to proven its usefulness. And we've seen this time and time again from network providers. If they think it's more security risk than a, a useful to the end users, they'll cut it completely. We've seen that many times. So what new tenant are you proposing? Is this the one? No. Yes? No, okay. Spencer. Uh, Spencer doing another uh, note taker interrupt. Um, we were doing pretty well until uh, we started the discussion with Christian and the people who participated in that discussion could uh, check what we captured. That would be great. Um, I know we missed something from uh, 
um, Igor completely. So, um, like I say, if you could take a if you could take a look at that, that would be great. Thank you. So we have five minutes. Yeah, um, we we can look at the three issues from IETF one one six. And they are fragmentation, encryption, and authentication. Uh, Mike, can you give us a very quick um, roundup of progress on these three points? Sure. And uh, thank you for moving on. Um, I uh, this is a little bit uh, with uh, me uh, doing a little bit of my own opinions in here, but. Uh, Fragmentation, in my view, is one of the one of the more promising things that we can use this for. Uh, we actually have a use case for that, which is things like request response protocols like DNS that uh, rely on IP fragmentation and really suffer. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, specification as it's now written, in my opinion, is incoherent. That's easily checked. Unfortunately, we've had very little review on this and very little comment uh, from persons other than myself and Eric Auerswald. And I would, uh, I, I'd really like to hear more feedback on that. I'm sure Joe would. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's a dangerous situation if something so central is not getting enough review. I complained about that privately to Gory. I'm complaining about it publicly to everyone else. Um, the encryption and authentication options, uh, Magnus has kind of uh, thrown down the gauntlet that they're just not mature enough to keep in the spec at this time. Uh, after vacillating a bunch, about 30 minutes before this meeting began, I sent a message to the list saying that I think that that's probably true uh, but we need to, uh, the working group as a group needs to uh, resolve those matters and decide whether to uh, defer those uh, latter two to uh, another document. Uh, uh, th I think those are the three really important things that we've got to absolutely have to do before we can ship this specification. Um, and I think that's all I have to say about the slide. Do you want to go on, Corey? I see Tom in the queue. Um, sure. But, um, Tom, Herbert, do you have a question? Or are you just a legacy hand? Excellent. OK. Uh, I'd, I'd like to try and understand um, how many people here want to work on the encryption part of this draft to see whether that is something that we want to develop as a group. Um, the current um, text is based on a document that was at one time submitted to TCPM, which is uh, no longer active. Um, is this a topic that people would like to work on, the encryption part of this document? And if you want to comment on that, or you would like to vote, please use the tool now to show your support for working on it. If you think we shouldn't work on this item in the working group, you can also vote against it. This is an input point to help us understand uh, what to do in this. As we're coming to the close of the meeting, I'm going to ask one more question, which I think uh, would help us a lot. Um, who thinks the authentication work should be completed first in this document as part of this document? So should we complete the proposed authentication work as part of this single document, or should we split it out as a separate piece of work, um, possibly into another draft and progress it there? So who thinks we should work on this in this document? Oh, 
Okay, so we, we see a few responses. This is all helpful. This discussion is going to have to conclude on the list. We will, we will speak to Joe as editor. Uh, Joe wasn't able to make this meeting, so we are not going to make decisions in his absence. However, we are going to talk to our AD and we will talk to anybody who has interest in progressing UDP options, trying to find a way to progress this as quickly as the IETF is capable of completing the work. Um, we've run out of time. This is the end of this TSVWG slot. Um, Martin. Can I ask a clarifying question on the encryption thing? Yes. Um, well, the vote was pretty firmly negative, but does that mean people do not want to try to perfect the like improvised crypto that he came up with or people don't want to address, like have any encryption solution maybe with some sort of more off the shelf <laughs> ciphers and so on? I didn't really ask that because I presume we could, if we complete UDP options, we could always do encryption work afterwards if there was enthusiasm to do so. Okay, so, uh, we so, have, so you interpreted that as meaning we should not? Um, at the moment, I, unfortunately, as I stated on the list, my chair position on this is we don't have a basis for doing this. We don't have a document which is complete to describe the encryption enough to make it a useful, interoperable spec. So we would have to have people to work on that. Yes. And we had only one person raise their hand yeah, in support and, of doing and, that. And that was me. That was you. Okay, well, excellent. <laughs> well, because I took it to mean, do we want to solve the problem of options encryption rather mm -hmm. than like, yeah. would we want to take this thing and like make it good? Uh, which is, a, I mean, I guess they're different questions, but all right, I guess. Well, that's a know. good clarification. So we now know who the one was and that okay. helps. Yeah. <laughs> and, and seriously, um, this is not a done thing, but please talk to us because we do need to make it a done thing soon and decide how to finish this work. Um, thank you ever so much for being here. We, will, I will be at the social event. Will you be there? Unfortunately, no, not. Day, you won't be there, job, Mike. Uh, either. <laughs> too much day job. Thank you, Mike, for your inputs and for the very hard work of putting all this into GitHub. Um, that's very much appreciated by the group. We'd buy you a beer if you were here, um, but we still thank you. And thanks everybody thank for coming you. to this meeting. Thank you all. Come Have a beer on my. I'm Daya. I have a bad draft. Uh, uh, about uh, UDP options, uh, that name is uh, 